She had slipped the guards and made it to the outer wall. Her nose stung in the cold, and the skin beneath her leathers was bruised. She barely made it out alive. But it appears Lady Luck was on her side. Shrouded by Nocturnal, she crept into the stables, stole the beast most spry, and made haste over the Gerals, wearing a satchel stuffed with a rainbow of jewels. Mercer was right. The strife was worth it, and with this hall sold, she would have enough to retire, enough to take her son away from Skyrim, somewhere nice and coastal, Wayrest or Sentinel, a place with a warm beach, away from this life of uncertainty. Across the mountains, her steed collapsed and heaved for breath in a pillow of snow, pushed to its limit. But she could not stop now. She kept going, ran through the night, and by dawn, she had made it to Falkreath, legs shaky and feet raw. And then that little bright flame of hope was snuffed in but a second. Her luck ran dry. Nocturnal's favor receded like the shadows of the morning. The Daedric Prince of Night and Darkness. Nocturnal, the Mistress of Shadows, Daughter of Twilight, Mistress of Mystery, and Saint of Suspicion. To most of Tamriel, she is regarded as Lady Luck, the patron of thieves and perhaps even those who roll the dice in a game of chance, and perhaps even more so those who would use guile and misdirection to shape such chance with sleight of hand. Luck is an interesting facet of the dynamic prince that is nocturnal, but later we'll dive into some theories and connections that may reveal her true psychology, but as the Shadow Queen is usually experienced, hers is the sphere of creeping darkness, the shadows that claim dominion of the land as the sun retreats behind the horizon. The very same shadows that hide the ill action of many a thief and murderer alike. Nocturnal, the Empress of Merc, is by her very nature incomprehensible. She is a prince defined by her mystery. Her mystique is as fundamental to her as the hunt is to her scene, or domination to Molag Bal. Nocturnal's defining trait is the obscurity. And so unlike other princes perhaps, we may not be able to ascertain such a clear answer as in the previous videos, but with a bird's eye view and thousands of years of Tamrielic record and knowledge, I think the motivations of this unfathomable Mistress of Shadows can be uncovered. Let us try today, in this Daedric deep dive, to deny Nocturnal her very sphere and make the unfathomable understandable. I suppose the best way to start this analysis is with the fundamentals that she is known by. Shadow, hide you. It's the classic blessing that thieves bestow upon thieves in their meetings. The relationship of Nocturnal with the many footpads, burglars, and cut purses of Tamriel is not often like that of a cultist and their patron Daedra. With Nocturnal, the relationship is far more transactional, even unconscious. And beyond that, the term Shadow Hide You has just become part of the culture of thievery, uttered even without any particular reverence for the prince. But rather, it is a saying that has caught on amongst all thieves of Tamriel, not unlike how thousands of unreligious people in our real world utter the phrase, oh my god. But of course there are many thieves who do share such a relationship with Nocturnal, those who seek her favor for the bit of luck she may bring, for the shadow that creeps just a little further obscuring the guard's vision. However, for most thieves, this is a relationship of trade, tit for tat rather than a fervent adoration of the Shadow Queen. But, at the very least, thieves recognize that they should not offend the Lady of Luck, for if you do so, she may make of you an inauspicious, if not truly ruinous, robber. But among the broad category that is thieves in their various tongs, syndicates, and guilds, there are some among them who are the most devout to the unfathomable prince. Such is the case of the Nightingales. In Skyrim, the Thieves' Guild that orchestrates its scandals from the darkness of the Ratway sewers is the very same that in its upper echelons harbors the secret trinity of the Nightingales. By most thieves, they are regarded as mere myths, fictions to inspire young footpads, stories that tell of consummate thieves that wear armor forged of midnight and serve the will of Nocturnal. Yet these thieves are very real and their purpose is beyond looking stylish in black. The Nightingale Trinity has been chosen from the greatest of the Thieves' Guild, and their sole defined duty is to protect the Twilight Sepulchre, an ancient temple of Nocturnal, and secured within it the Skeleton Key. 
Unlike the nature of other relationships with Daedric princes, this functions more like a business transaction. Nocturnal gets skilled thieves to protect her temple and skeleton key, and the skilled thieves get the otherworldly armor and exceptional blessings for which they can use for whatever pursuit they see fit. They must simply ensure that the Twilight Sepulchre is protected, and the additional caveat is that even in death, their service does not end. Kalaya, a nightingale, says this on the matter. No, not gone. He's become one with the shadows. This is the greatest honor a nightingale can possibly achieve. In death, he's become a part of that which we use to live. Absolutely. When we say, walk with the shadows, we are asking those nightingales who have passed on to protect us. It's believed that they are literally what guides our uncanny luck by placing their hands in ours. That's why the Ebonmere needed to be reopened. Without it, there's no way Nocturnal was able to allow them through. The Thieves' Guild is not aware of such arrangement, and the plot of the Thieves' Guild questline in Skyrim is directly related to this. Mercer Frey was one such nightingale who turned on his oath, stole the skeleton key, and used it for his own gain at the expense of those he called friends and associates. Without the favor of Nocturnal, the Guild befalls a bout of bad luck, crippling the organization of Riften. Of course, Mercer is dealt with, and the oath with Nocturnal is restored. But such ambition, the kind that inspires one to double-cross a god, is not unheard of amongst thieves. In fact, Mercer Frey was an admirer of the legendary Grey Fox. Perhaps this is what inspired him to double-cross Nocturnal. The Grey Fox is a persona worn by many throughout history, but this legacy of a mythic master thief all started with a man named Emma Dareloth. The stories say that he stole the cowl of Nocturnal herself, and being the very hood of a Daedric prince, it was drenched in power. However, in response, Nocturnal cursed the cowl to steal the identity of its wearer. When one dons the cowl, their identity is lost, as if struck from the Elder Scrolls themselves, erased from history. Memory will hide in the shadows, and even those who knew you closest cannot seem to recall who you are. That is the curse of the cowl. And so the cowl has been passed from master to master of the Thieves' Guild in Cyrodiil, creating the mythic figure of the Grey Fox. As a quick side note, Shadow Hide You is also inscribed on the cowl's front, and perhaps it was this that inspired the phrase in the first place. It was only with the work of Count Corvus Umbernox, the bearer of the cowl at the end of the Third Era, and his protege, that the curse would be removed. They had to plan a heist, steal an Elder Scroll, and with it the curse of Nocturnal would be removed. The cowl still hid the identity of the wearer and persisted as an identity in itself, but no longer would its wearer be struck from the histories nor unrecognizable in memory. One could wear the cowl and be the Grey Fox, yet come home to their family and be known by them. So the Thieves' Guild has a long-standing relationship with Nocturnal, yet to call them part of Nocturnal's cult would be entirely inaccurate. Nocturnal's sphere is far beyond that of petty thievery and a robber's glory. This series began with a video on Hermaeus Mora, and when discussing his origin, we brought up one of his titles as Ur Daedra, or shortened to Ur Dra. In essence, this definition means the earliest or original Daedric princes, the first to crystallize in the Orbis. This designation of Ur Dra has been attributed to Hermaeus Mora, Numira, and yet also Nocturnal herself. The implication here is that like Nimira and Mora, she is among the eldest and most powerful princes, and perhaps in what these Daedra share we can find some deeper meaning. This is my favorite part of the video, where we get to dive into the mythological interpretations of these enigmatic beings and try to decipher some inkling of common root that may reveal a deeper truth. The Reachmen, who have worshipped Daedra since they were born in the caves of the Druidark, know Nocturnal as the Spirit of the Night, who they give offering to for protection. It's said her crows will guard them and perhaps alert Reachfolk to dangers that their human eyes cannot see. We've yet to bring up crows and all kinds of symbolic comparison we can make, and we will later, but amongst the Reachfolk she plays a rather minor role. But to the Khajiit, she is a far more significant figure, and within their mythology we may be able to glimpse an understanding of her prized artifact, the Skeleton Key. To the Khajiit, she is regarded as one of the Dark Spirits, among the likes of Lorcage, Namira, and Vemina. 
the silent priest Amun Dro writes this about her. Noctra, the shadow thief, daughter of twilight, born from the black blood of Lorcage at the steps of the void gate. In the songs, Boethra battled this spirit until it knew it was not Nomira. When this was done, Nocturnal was brought before Azura to be judged. Azura showed mercy and allowed Noctra to live so long as she served Azura into the Jarkaje. But Nocturnal is rebellious by nature, so she stole one of Azura's keys and fled back into the void. It is written that Azura sent the true spirit of Lorcash to find her, and ever since, Noctra has aided the Khajiit when called. Tribes may whisper to Noctra for silence, shade, and luck. Do not summon her to perform vile deeds, for this will bring the dark with her. There's plenty to talk about here and lots that will help us reveal her connections to Namira and the Void, but first, let us address the nature of the key that she stole from Azura. Azura in Khajiit mythology is the most central deity and she is described as the keeper of all gates and keys, all rims and thresholds. And we know that Nocturnal's most prized artifact, which she guards and binds Nightingales to protect in life and death, is the Skeleton Key. If taken at face value, then it would seem that Khajiiti myth implies that the Skeleton Key was once in the possession of Azura, and Nocturnal deceived Azura and escaped with it into the Void. And that is just too significant. For Nocturnal's continual association with the Void is just too hard to ignore. You may be most commonly familiar with the idea of Sithis, the embodiment of the Void itself. This is the interpretation of the Void most commonly popularized by the Dark Brotherhood of Assassins, which perhaps itself came from the Argonians' understanding, who recognized Sithis as a very important deity. And in Altmeri Faith, Sithis manifested as the limitations of Anuel. This is largely unimportant, and the gist is that Sithis equals the Void, whereas in Khajiit mythology and Curious Curiously, the mythology of the Reachmen, it is Namira that is the personification of the Void. Now, I mentioned this in the Daedric Princes Explained video, which is a primer that starts this series off, that Aedra and Daedra is an elven classification. In Aldmeri tongues, Aedra means our ancestors, and Daedra means not our ancestors. And of course, Aldmeri religion has had a great influence on Tamriel as a whole, Given that it was dominated by the Elves in the Mrathic Era, and the next most influential force that would be the various Cyrodiilic Empires have their core faith as the Eight Divines, which itself is a synthesis of ancient Nordic and Aldmeri pantheons. But let's not forget that this is all from an Elven subjective. In Khajiit and Reachman understanding, it was what the Elves would call Daedra, that were the prime movers of creation, which runs opposite to the idea that they are not ancestors because they refuse to help in the formation of Mundus. For myself, I have found the most helpful definition of Daedra is ultimately comes from or their soul is bound to oblivion. But I bring this all up because to the Khajiit, both what are classically considered Aedra and Daedra appear in combination across their designations and groupings of gods, which they collectively call the spirits. Regardless, without the rigid lens of Aedra and Daedra, it's easier to understand why Namira, by both the Reachmen and the ancient Khajiit, could be considered the personification of the Void, despite being classically a Daedric prince. Khajiit mythology speaks of Noctra as the black blood of Lorcaj, whose elven equivalent is Lorcan. The story goes that the two greater beings of Khajiit mythology, those being Anur and Fadamai, an Anu and Padame equivalent, mated and created the many spirits in several litters. Anur was then done, but Fadamai tricked him into giving him more children than he wanted, and when Anur found out, he struck Fadamai and she fled into the void, and it was here that she gave birth to Lorcaj, and this child's heart was filled with the great darkness, and that darkness finally knew its name, and it was Namira. The darkness within would lead Lorcaj to trick and trap his brothers and sisters in Mundus, and in revenge they tore his heart and hid it deep within Nerni. Lorcaj then fled to Azura sustained by the darkness within him and asked for help. Namira was swimming in his open wound, and Azura cleansed him of that corruption and flung his dark heart into the void, and so Lorcaj perished. But from Lorcaj's gaping wound poured black blood, molten ebony, and from this blood spawned Noctra, that is, Nocturnal herself. 
This tale of their mythology directly connects Nocturnal to the Void as a byproduct of Namira's corruption of Lorcage. Their tales even say that Boethia at first mistook Nocturnal for Namira, and if we were to view her in such a way, we can get a rather clear idea of her nature. Namira is the Void, the infinite and great darkness, yet Nocturnal, born of Void-tainted blood, is the shadow of the encroaching Void. Her existence is born of its corruption. She is the dark corner in a well-lit room, the encroaching gloom of night, the space between Namira and the world of Lorcaja's heart. Noctra is born of the darkness's corruption, but she is not literally the Void. Her very presence is the lucid reminder of the overbearing and infinite darkness that creeps into our world and in its shade brings malice and nihilism. There is a huge tangent to be had here on Shadow Magic and her part in it soon. However, let's remember that Noctra stole what we believe is the skeleton key from Azura. So before we move on from the Khajiit mythology, let's dive into that a little bit. The skeleton key has appeared as a key, or at times a lockpick, but despite its various designs, its initially understood purpose is that it is an unbreakable and incredibly effective lockpick. Now, this seems rather trivial at first, perhaps useful only to locksmiths and prospective thieves. A skeleton key, by definition, is any type of master key that is built in such a way that it can open numerous locks, but not any lock. However, Nocturnal Skeleton Key, well I suppose Azura's Skeleton Key, that the Patron of Thieves stole, can open any lock and not just locked doors. The Skeleton Key has vast potential. It can unlock many things, metaphysical gates even, portals to Daedric realms, liminal crawl spaces, even unlock one's own hidden potential, perhaps buried by gates of rationale and limiting beliefs. The Skeleton Key has so much hidden potential, and what occurred in the mid-second era is a prime example of its possibility. I spoke in our last episode of this series about Clavicus Vile and his involvement in the Triad three scheming Daedric princes among whom are Mafala and Nocturnal. At this time, Sotha Sil, the clockwork god of the tribunal, had come into the possession of the Skeleton Key, keeping it safe and locked away in his clockwork city, but Nocturnal wanted her key for her grand designs. Now is the best time to discuss shadow magic. It is an obscure and powerful form of magic, some say related to illusion and mysticism, but its true power goes beyond mere trickery. Azra Nightwielder was a pioneer in its use, and he was the first to discover that shadow is not just an absence of light, but a reflection of possible worlds created by forces in conflict. In the most basic sense, a shadow that you may see on the ground is created by the forces of the static object and light. Light hits the rock, and so shadow is created, which Azra hypothesized is a reflection of possible worlds. But Azra further posited that if shadow is a reflection of possible worlds, if he could through shadow magic manipulate the shadow, then in turn, that could have an effect on the real world. This knowledge has powerful applications. Beyond this, he expanded his understanding of shadow to take it in the most metaphorical sense. If shadow is possibility created by forces in conflict, then almost everything and everyone has a shadow. And through shadow magic, this can be used to manifest such possibilities. For example, basic functions of shadow magic might be manifesting a blade made of shadow or rather improve one's strength or speed. In lack of strength, there is a shadow, or rather a possibility for it. And so with the use of shadow magic, such possibility of present strength can be made reality. In a way, it seems that shadow magic, in essence, is the manifestation of possibilities. That is, the shadows of possibility left in the wake of the chain of causality. Shadow magic is a vast topic with so many applications, and the vastness of the field cannot be covered in this small part of the video, but with Nocturnal as Shadow Queen, the manifestation of two forces in conflict, existence and the void, you best believe she can conjure up some powerful shadow magic, and perhaps also this understanding of such magic will help us contextualize her goals within the Daedric Triad. So Sotha Sil had the skeleton key, and we mentioned in the Clavicus Vile video that Barbara stole a powerful staff and used it to gain access to the Clockwork City, and using such information, Nocturnal tried to take control of said city. With her powerful magic, she summoned Sotha Sil's shadow in an attempt to replace the real Sotha Sil as ruler. 
The clockwork apostles, Sill's followers, along with a vestige and Duvaith Fear, tried to keep the skeleton key out of the Shadow's hands, but they were unable to. Nocturnal and the Shadow of Sotha Sill attempted to use the skeleton key to unseat the real Sotha Sill from his throne and truly make the Shadow the ruler, and by extension, Nocturnal. But the vestige and his companions were able to prevent this from happening, and the skeleton key was entrusted to the Telvanni wizard Devaith Fear for its protection. But Nocturnal's scheming did not end here, and she was not defeated without gain. In fact, taking the Clockwork City was a diversion for her real motive, which was to gain Sotha Sill's hidden techniques. There is a lot of plot here, and I want to try and shorten it, but essentially, the Daedric Triad conspired to steal the Heart of Transparent Law, which is the stone of the Crystal Tower in the Somerset Isles. The towers and their stones are intrinsically connected to the stability of Nern, and not only our Nern, but multiple planes of reality, perhaps even the infinite realms of possible worlds, Kalpas perhaps, and Nocturnal had plans to abuse this. She had stolen a technique from Sotha Sil, which he used along with the rest of the tribunal to draw their divine power from the heart of Lorcan. She wanted to use this same technique on the Heart of Transparent Law, but in reverse, to draw the life energy of Nern, and then the energy of the other Daedric Princes which she would use to amplify the Crystal Tower and use its tenfold power to make herself infinite, her power limitless. Obviously, she failed, but it is this ordeal that reveals Nocturnal to be far more sinister than a surface reading of the Prince may provide. Perhaps part of her psychology is she craves to be void-like, infinite, everything, to stretch her shadow to every corner so that there is only her. This is all rather theoretical, but do you think that perhaps Nocturnal, born of Lorcage's void-tainted blood, is frustrated by possibility and instead craves the certainty of the void, the great darkness? I like to think that with Nocturnal as the mistress of Shadow, and Shadow's true nature being possibility, this would make Nocturnal possibility manifest, yet she seems to be at odds with this, and her goal, at the very least with the Heart of Transparent Law, seems to be that she wants to end possibility and become all outcomes across all realities. The truth of every potential Kalpa, adjacent place, or multiverse planes that we have no hope of comprehending. Consider that her cultists often describe her as all-encompassing, and that they are unable to think of anything but her will. Her influence is like a creeping shadow, appearing in the dreams of the lonely, tipping them in her favor, becoming a source of comfort, yet the intent is entirely manipulative and consuming. Some such followers could end up being stripped of their being and turned into one of her many gloam knights, multi-armed shadow wraiths of nocturnal, incapable of sympathy with naught but malice and inconceivable nature. Another of her notable Daedric servants are the Nocturnal Shrikes, tall, pale, scantily clad women of an eerie beauty. Crow callers, shadow weavers, gloom sirens, and night sisters, these are Daedra of rank and title, of caste lesser and greater, not dissimilar to Dramora, yet they are not as emotionless as their Daedric prince. In fact, Shrikes are prone to bouts of melancholy, such as seen with Jaciel Morgan, the greater Nocturnal. I can imagine with such a nihilistic master, such a disposition would be easy to gain. Shrikes are also known to employ magics associated with crows, and you may have noticed that the Prince Nocturnal herself is also accompanied by crows, and at that, she has other Daedric servants, such as the Wraith of Crows, and her realm of Evergloam contains a pocket realm called the Crows Wood, a nightmarish forest ruled by the Blackfeather Court, each member a sentient crow. There are some potent real-world comparisons to be had here, similarities and symbolism that can help us understand the inspirations behind her theme. Nocturnal in Skyrim has appeared to us with her arms adorned by two crows, and her statue in both Skyrim and Oblivion, as well as her incarnation in Daggerfall, depict her with two crows rested upon her. And further, her sigils among Daedric cultists and the Reach folk is that of either a crow or a crow's talon. But this reminds me of one particular real-world deity, commonly depicted alongside his crows Huon and Mjun, and that is the Norse god Odin. 
In Norse mythology, Huon and Muon are sent out by Odin every day at dawn and their watchful eyes scour the land and they return before dinner to keep Odin informed of events. In short, they are his watchers. And quite interestingly, in a comprehensive look at Odin, one might find that there is lots of magic and mystery involved with his character and he has had intentions that modern man would classify as quite sinister. He is a seeker of knowledge and a practitioner of magics that would tarnish his honor, yet care he does not. Odin, for the context of the time, bears several effeminate qualities, such as practicing Seder magic, typically exclusive to the female gender roles, and to transgress such roles at the time was to bring shame upon oneself. Odin seeks to overcome limitation through any means, whether by sacrificing himself to himself upon Yggdrasil, or breaking convention by using feminine Seder magics, he would pursue an unrelenting, uncompromising quest for wisdom, knowledge, and power. Now, we could compare Nocturnal and see similarities in the crow motifs, of course, but Nocturnal's pursuit of the infinite, to spread her shadow, to become all, is pursued with the same vigor and ruthlessness as Odin in his quest. She has no sympathy, no love or care bestowed upon followers unless it is via manipulation. It's also worthwhile noting that Odin is often seen as a trickster, a manipulator who does as he wills to achieve his ends. And this is not unlike Nocturnal. Now, of course, this is not a strict one-to-one, -one, but I believe Odin serves as a partial inspiration for Nocturnal, and most particularly her connection to the Crows. Now, earlier in the video, I mentioned that we want to explore Nocturnal and her status as Lady Luck, a bestower of good fortune. Luck, in essence, is a phenomenon that defines the experience of improbable events, typically associated with the random. However, in the Elder Scrolls, in games prior to Skyrim's removal of the attribute system, Luck played a somewhat improbable important role in the game mechanics, but before we dive into that, consider that if shadow is possibility and shadow magic is manipulation of those forces, and if luck is intrinsically tied to probability, then could not one with powerful shadow magic change the perceived luck of an individual? This seems to be exactly what Nocturnal does. Her luck, her favor, the shadow hide you, is in essence may luck favor you. It means, may nocturnal bend the shadows of possibility so that you may appear lucky and fortunate. In Old Dagger 4 lore, there was a god of luck called Sai. Story is that he was a mortal that spread luck to others, and Ebon Arm, another god of the Daggerfall era with scarcer reference in contemporary Elder Scrolls, made him a mortal on the condition that he spread his luck around. But perhaps this Psy was somehow naturally in tune with Shadow, and perhaps all those we would consider lucky, or those in game terms with a high attribute of luck, are somehow in tune with the Shadows, aka the infinite worlds of possibility made by forces in conflict. So that for lucky individuals, the favorable outcomes among the myriad of possibilities come to fruition. For example, the conflict is stealing an apple, say. You the thief are the force, thrust upon the apple. This creates the conflicting forces. And let's say you stumble and bump the apple so it rolls and the stall owner notices you. This would be characterized perhaps as unlucky. You may be regarded as clumsy or inept. But in this instance, in the shadow of this event are many possibilities. You could have stolen successfully, you could have been grabbed before you could touch it because a passerby noticed you, and many more variations of the same event. Luck would be the shadows of possibility most aligned with good fortune and positive outcomes, and perhaps greater luck is a result of those more attuned to the worlds of desired possibility, or perhaps it is the silent hand of Nocturnal that with her shadow magic helps manifest such desirable possibilities. This is all very theoretical, and we will likely never have a direct answer, but I think I've done a decent job of connecting shadows, and by extension shadow magic, to the realms of possibility and luck, and hence nocturnal sphere is made whole. I would posit that Nocturnal, in ways, is a Daedric Prince of Possibility, of which shadows are the metaphorical representation. Consider that the entire Orbis is called the Grey Maybe, because it is the uncertainty that lies between Anu and Padme, the infinite and finite, the everything and the void, existence and nullification, and within this Grey Maybe of the Orbis, there is possibility. 
In a similar way, Nocturnal is born of the same interplay. Lorcage, the creator of Mundus, the material world, is tainted by the void, Namira, and when it comes to his demise, Lorcage was the very embodiment of the conflict of what is and what is not, and from his very own black blood is born Nocturnal, Lady Luck, Mistress of Shadows, the manifestation of possibility. But like I mentioned before, I feel as if Nocturnal's motives with the Triad and the Crystal Tower reveal an inner discontent, and that she desires to expand her influence eternal until she becomes all infinite and total, all shadows, that is, all possibilities, unified as Nocturnal. Perhaps, as she is born of Lorcash's black blood, she is the representation of the Void's corruption, but we know the corruption was not total, and Lorcash sought the cleansing of Azura before his death, and so Noctra, born in the aftermath, is symbolic of the Void's creeping shadow and desire to nullify while at the same time being representative of possibility and existence itself, because without Lorcage and Namira, material and void meeting, Nocturnal is not possible. She is the shadow. She is the forces meeting. She is the result of the forces in conflict. Now, of course, this is heavily relying on speculation and Kujiti mythology at that, but with Nocturnal, most of Tamriel regards her as a patron of thieves and shadow mystery woman, with zero further insight. The symbolic nature of possibility and the in-between is also seen in her realm of Evergloam, the cradle of shadow filled with forests whose trees creak in the winds, gusts that wither the crumbling stones of castles and crypts submerging into the murky waters of cold. Yet it is the violet sky of twilight that makes this place most notable. Evergloam, stuck in the perpetual in-between, the space between day and night, again two forces in conflict. One of her cultists gives a most haunting account of her realm. This realm of oblivion bathed in purple sky, stars splattered like flecks of paint, falling streaking across my eyes. A dark forest encroaches, filled with her creatures, wolves of shadows, spirits haunting, her shrikes which sing, sing just for me, a melody which I cannot hum. Blue lights fill her land, mesmerizing, blue flowers that glow in the darkness with a kind light, deceptive light. Yellow fires burn, burning against the blues and purples, crypts lie submerged in murky waters, cold, cold, as cold as my hands. Her land is decay, bloated and purple, the trees cast long, dark shadows, the path is winding, branching, there's a castle in the distance, broken apart, this world is broken apart, crumbling, crumbling, the stone is crumbling, like my mind is crumbling, tumbling, tumbling into decay, into her shadow. I walk within this shadow world into a counterfeit one, the realm of a prince to the creation of a god, from soaking green to burning sand. The sun is blinding, weakening. I am shadow, banished with a light. I crave it, but it hurts. I cannot have it. I cling to darkness as the darkness clings to me. I sleep, but find no rest, no night to come, no morning after, just dusk endless and gloomy, no rest for us wicked souls, nightmares swarm, swarm like her crows, endless eyes watching me, singing which lures me in, the darkness seeps beneath my fingernails, under my eyelids, between my guts, like tar I'll fall apart if I rip it out. My mistress lulls me into this slumber, into this nightmare. I cannot awaken, for I have become the nightmare. I am one of her shadow creatures. I am the wolf that howls, the spider that crawls, the spirits which haunt this plain. I will feel nothing as I strike. I have nothing left to feel, save her. Evergloam is her realm, but within the Cradle of Shadows are many pocket realms, such as the Crowswood, the Shade Perilous, and the Ebonmere, which is more of a gateway found in the Twilight Sepulchre. But in addition to her realms, I feel as if I should speak of the last of her Daedric artifacts, those not previously mentioned, such as the Grey Cowl and the Skeleton Key. The most mysterious of the bunch is the Eye of Nocturnal. Little is known about it outside of its function as a literal eye. Nocturnal can see out of it, and it was stolen by two Argonians at the end of the Third Era, and upon its recovery her champion was awarded the Skeleton Key for its use. There is also a curious weapon called the Shade Sickle, made at first by Breton artifices, but associated with Nocturnal and known as an instrument of her will. A blade of foreboding and preternatural edge, those struck by it would have the living 
separated from their shadows, and with their shadows removed, a person begins to lose touch with themselves. Thoughts beyond the basic facts of life dissipate until the hapless creature is nothing but a thrall. And if we were correct in our interpretation of shadow being directly linked with possibility, if not an outright metaphor for it, then it makes sense that when someone is denied their shadow, they are denied possibility, their free will in a sense, and instead they become thralls, slaves to instincts entirely determined by those that control them. They have the lack of possibility. Finally, there is the very on-the-nose artifact, the Bow of Shadows, a bow that grants invisibility and increased speed, a perfect tool for an assassin. Its original owner was the legendary ranger Raelus Guile, who took down scores of foes with a bow on his failed last mission, but towards the end of the second era, this weapon would be in the hands of the assassin named Dram, a lieutenant who served Tiber Septum and was a crucial instrument of Admiral Richton. Dram's was the arrow that struck Prince Ator dead in the battle of Hunting Bay. But that, I think, is the crux of what I have to say on Nocturnal. Thievery is by far the smallest part of her sphere, in my opinion. If Khajiiti mythology is to be believed, and if today we have made a correct assessment of her motives with the Crystal Tower, then she is a being of possibility, of interplay, the shadows of the Grey Maybe, the encroaching penumbra of the Void, the personification of conflicting forces, she who commands the realms of shadow, of possibility, the Lady of Luck. But at the same time, she seems to crave infinite replication, to be all, to spread her shadow like the great darkness, to be like the void. The Daedric Princes are the best part of the Elder Scrolls lore, and I'm so excited that you guys are enjoying this series, and I would ask of you to like the video in support of this content if you do enjoy it, subscribe for more of these Daedric Prince explorations, and please do comment below and contribute to the theory crafting and conversation. It's one of the greatest parts of the Elder Scrolls, there's so much room for interpretation, a theory crafting, and discussion, so let's get to it. Thank you all again so much for watching. My name is Scott from Fudge Muppet, and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.